to the Turn On Your Inner Light Show. It's time to stop just surviving, and it's time to begin to thrive. It's time to live happier and healthier. Turn stress into strength. Noted author Debbie Mandel will show you how to move beyond personal doubts and fears and into positive perception to turn on your inner light. Here's your host, Debbie Mandel. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to my show. Our guest expert, Kate Sukel, has written for USA Today, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, is a frequent contributor to the Dana Foundation's Many Signs publications and the author of Dirty Minds, How Our Brains Influence Love, Sex, and Relationships. This book will help you rethink your perceptions about love. Welcome, Kate. Thanks for having me. Well, based on what you've written and you made this assertion, should we change the, the Valentine's Day symbol from a heart to a brain? <laughs> well, of course, historically, you know, the heart has been thought to be the seat of our passions, the seat of our love. Um, but as neuroscientific research has moved forward, we've learned that really our behaviors are more tied into our brain. The heart is just a really good blood pump. Um, so I think it would. There, there's an argument to be made for it, uh, but it might not be as cute looking as all those those big red hearts you see. Well, we could redirect. I mean, that's stereotyping. The brain could be made more attractive. They did a pretty <laughs> good job sketching the heart. But then what do we do with all that research that says when a loved one dies, sometimes people do physically die of a broken heart, not of a broken brain or an aneurysm? Well, again, you know, even our heart function, our cardiovascular function is um, influenced, it's directed by our brain activity. So, you know, if you take it a step further and you look at what's causing that broken heart syndrome, it probably has something to do with the brain as well and the, you know, autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the stress of it? Constriction yes. of blood vessels based on what we unleash hormonally, inflammation, yes. right? And also, you know, there's been work that looks at heartbreak, and it is profound. In fact, there's usually more activation um, when somebody is mourning a love than there is when they're actually passionately in love. And so I think that the absence of something that is so rewarding really can um, have grave impact to our health and to our general well-being and uh, hurl people into uh, depression. I, I think we're now wrestling with that as a psychiatric disorder, grief. Um, well, you know, of course, the depression can happen a number of ways. Um, there are chemical imbalances in the brain that may lead to depressive episodes, but of course there are things in your life that can happen that can, you know, also pull you down. Um, Right now, they're sort of treated the same way, often. Um, and I think as we move forward, we're going to find that there's more than just one type of depression. There's going to be more than one type of chemical, uh, you know, sort of chemically derived depression as well. Um, we're learning more and more every day. And that doesn't mean, however, no matter how you get it, it still can be just as severe. Yeah, it all, all symptoms lead to Rome. But what I find interesting about grief and depression and becoming a psychiatric order, a, a disorder really, officially, is taps in for me into the medicalization of America. Here's, oh, you're sad. Well, you have reason to be sad. Instead of wrestling with it and coping and giving yourself time, here's the pill for you. Right. I, you know, I think that there are people who have you know, grave medical distress who can benefit from those pills. I don't think everyone who's being prescribed antidepressants should be on them right now. I think that, that definitely, you know, there was just a recent study that showed um, that the placebo effect was actually stronger than antidepressant uh, treatment in one group of patients that had depression. And that says a lot to me. That means knowing that you're going to get well, being able to talk about it, know that the pain won't last forever, can often be more helpful to you than taking that magic pill. We know how powerful the placebo effect, which goes back to proving your assertion about the brain and love. I mean, people have believed that their cardiovascular system was healed and uh, just giving someone a pill for many conditions and the doctor packaging it properly with the right verbiage 
can really change our response. So the mind can do a lot of healing. Mm -hmm. Now, um, how does knowing, you wrote this book, and it's technical, and it covers all bases, and it's very entertaining. I love the the cute witticisms and you putting in your own life. But how can this help a lay person in matters of love? What do you want me as a reader to glean out of the complexities of love? Really the important thing for me and what I hope, what, what I took away from the research and what I hope everyone else will is that nobody is unlovable. This love stuff is as crazy and complicated and messy for everybody. Um, and while there are so many books out there that tell you there's only one way you could do love, there's only one way to happiness, our biology suggests that that's just not so. So what I hope is that people look at their own um, sort of experiences with a new lens and realize that there is nothing unlovable about anyone. This is a drive in all of us. It's a possibility in all of us. And we should embrace that. You know what I found interesting? If anything, it would make me more schooled in my decisions. I don't think after reading this book, I would fall in love. I would say, hmm, let me create a ledger of pluses and minuses <laughs> because I don't want my circuitry, my neuropeptides, my hormones to get in the way of a good decision. Well, ultimately, you know, we have these great big frontal lobes in our brain that allow us to make these decisions. But I think already, so often, we turn that decision-making off. We, we don't listen to our biology. Um, and this is something that we should do more of. For me, after doing the research and learning, I'm listening a little bit more closer to my subconscious about people. When I meet someone, um, I'm not denying an attraction when, because maybe he's, he, he doesn't have the right kind of job or come from, you know, the right sort of family situation. And then I'm not trying to heighten an attraction or make something out of, um, you know, some, uh, something that's not there uh, just because he does meet this list. So I think it, it's, it's helpful to know all the ways we can actually talk ourselves out of love as well. I wouldn't be keeping a ledger. I'd just be <laughs> listening very closely to what my body is telling me when I'm interacting with someone. I like I like what you said. I, I kept a ledger, <laughs> and I still do. For me, that works. Uh, give me your resume, <laughs> and then I'll let you know if I fall in love with you or not. Uh, but that could be my frontal lobes. Now, do good girls like bad boys? Well, it's a great line, and of course there is something so irresistible about a big strapping man. Um, but really what that's talking about is not necessarily bad boys. It's talking about testosterone levels. Um, so, and in fact, good girls, and not even good g girls, just all girls, we really like guys with lots of testosterone when we're in the most fertile part of our cycle. So... Um, you know, bad boys, it's a, it's a cute moniker. It really has to do with the fact that men who have a lot of testosterone tend to be more virile. They're more active. They're going to be the firefighter or the guy riding the motorcycle or the soldier. Or the pirate. Uh, <laughs> but on that uh, note, I'm going to spirit you away. We go to commercial break, and we will return with Kate Skull, author of Dirty Mind. <laughs> Now you can take Debbie Mandel home with you. Her book, Turn On Your Inner Light, Fitness for Body, Mind, and Soul, will help you decompress with healthy, positive, concrete solutions. Common life challenges are presented so that you can quickly find the help you need. Emotional tips, original meditations, and a fun and easy-to-follow fitness workout for each mindset. This revolutionary new method will help you rewire mind and body to take back your power. Get it on Amazon. Are you overwhelmed with the burden of taking care of children, parents, or both? Are you taking care of everyone else except yourself? It's time to change your habits and re-energize. Debbie Mandel gives you an innovative and easy-to-follow program for good health and happiness. In her magical new book, Changing Habits, The Caregiver's Total Workout, Debbie Mandel shows you step-by-step -step how to find the optimal balance between giving and receiving and guides you to exercise and eat right to take care of yourself. What are you waiting for? Read Changing Habits and start training for your life. 
Life does not need to be a burden. Get changing habits at the Caregiver's Total Workout on Amazon. You're listening to the Turn On Your Inner Light Show. I'm your host, Debbie Mandel, and I'm speaking with Kate Zuckel, author of Dirty Minds. Now, I really like that title. Maybe you should have called it Dirty Neuropeptides or Dirty (laughs) Circuitry. But as we were saying, we like men with virility, I guess, to propagate the species. Is that your point? Yeah, um, but I think what's interesting is that we can pick up on these things without even really being aware of it. So our brains are designed really well so that when we interact with somebody else, you know, we we are drawn to these things, even though we may not realize, oh, well, if he's this, this means he's chock full of testosterone. Um, but now we not... are. Once you read the book, you are. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you may start really, thinking about it. You can yeah. dissect a guy now. And I like that. And not, I didn't say eviscerate, <laughs> but dissect a guy. So I could really stay there and say, well, I'm ovulating now, so I better be careful in my choice. You know, I, I mean, I know knowledge is power, and I can make that. What do you say to the concept that women are attracted to geeks now? Um, well, you know, I, I think that... Uh it's entirely possible. I think, you know, they, they may be just as virile and just as uh, what have you, but they know that that's a, a, a career choice that is good for them. Uh, you know, our whole, our whole lives are becoming geekier as we move on. So it's hard to know. What, but I think that the important thing is our brains are picking up on all these little subtle signals. And not only that, they're also giving them off. So say, strippers, when they're at their most fertile, take in more tips. Men rate women who are in the most fertile part of their cycle as being more attractive. Um, so there are all these little things, a lot of chemistry, for lack of a better word, going on between two people uh, when they meet that make up this attraction. And pheromones, <laughs> like the lower, <laughs> like the insects. But you know why I think women are attracted to geeks based on your book? Why? I think because geeks can be a way to protect a woman. Earn a good living, smart, smart, ensure survival of the species as well. It's not so much brute force anymore, but it's a kind of power. What do you think of that, Missy? Hmm. I, I don't, you know, I think that we certainly, culture is changing. What we consider to be sexy is changing. I think that there's power involved with wealth that can sometimes be seen and also testosterone driven. Um, but, you know, I think that with any attraction, um, in fact, one of the researchers I talked to said, eat him for a month. See if you still like him for the whole of your cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's something that, that a lot of women would benefit from. Spending a month, getting to know them all the way through the cycle to see they're really as compelling as you think they are. And that's whether they're a bad boy or a geek. That's a wonderful uh, idea. And especially, I think, anyone who gets into a relationship you know, it spends uh, time, let's say a few months with a guy, and then you see they break up after that. So sometimes it's beyond that first month or that seven-year itch. We speak in monogamous relationships that uh, are so much in the news now. Now, I like something that you wrote, and I thought it was so cute and well put, that you say babies are very sexy. Oh, they are. My... My son, I think he is the most amazing creature on the planet. And, of course, you know, one of my best friends thinks her child is, and truth is, we're both right. Mm -hmm. Um, Your perception of your child, I mean, it sort of makes sense that our kids would be so rewarding because they require a lot of commitment. We're not rats who get to give up our babies after a week. You know, we're in it for the long haul. And if they weren't so compelling, so sexy, I mean, it's not meant in a creepy way. It's just in that sort of irresistible, compelling way, we'd probably, you know, not bother having kids. And many women don't. You know, many women don't have these feelings. Why? 
many women don't have kids. Um, and, many, and, uh, and they don't have these bonding feelings that you describe. Well, I think that, that sort of normal brain circuitry and a normal pregnancy helps create this feeling, helps create this bond. Of course, the word normal is so loaded whenever you talk about this because, you know, think normal is a statistical term. You have to think of the curve, right? Mm -hmm. um, it sort of looks like a mountain, and normal behaviors are what's at the top of the mountain. But usually you don't have this really, you know, sharp peak. You have this sort of rounded thing. Um, so there's a lot of behaviors, a lot of that bonding can fit in, um, you know, what the range of normal. Um, our brains are designed to create this bond. They help us become, you know, better weather the, both the challenges and the rewards of parenting. But for some reason, with some people, it doesn't quite work out that way. And it may be that there's a lack of this sort of neuropeptide, the lack of communication, um, you know, I was saying that the brains, when you're attracted, pick something up from other people. There may be some kind of um, mix-up in the chemistry. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but the default is for this bond to be very strong. Now, does that, the father have the same kind of bond? The father has a similar bond. Um, in fact, uh, they also uh, go through changes. Their brain goes through changes uh, during pregnancy, which... For me, when I first read about it, I thought, are you kidding me? I get the stretch marks and I get all this and I don't even get a, a super special, unique bond. That's well, no let's, hold, let's hold that thought because we're going to stretch ourselves over to commercial break and return with Kate Suko, author of Dirty Minds. <laughs> I'm excited to tell you about my new book, Addicted to Stress. This is a message you need to hear. Are you addicted to stress? Do you do it all while everyone depends on you? Where's all this pressure coming from? It is coming from inside you. This is why my publisher, John Wiley, asked me to write Addicted to Stress, a woman's seven-step program to reclaim joy and spontaneity in life. This fun to read book teaches proven strategies to reclaim your life, silence your inner critic, build a healthy body, and refrain your thoughts to change your life for the better. Dare to be happy without the guilt. Addicted to stress is easy to get. It's available at Barnes and Noble and other fine bookstores everywhere. You can also buy it at Amazon and other online retailers. back with Kate Zuckel and Dirty Mind. So you were about to talk about the stretch marks that women get <laughs> and men don't. Yes, and yet men also have bond, you know, bond with their children. Uh, we're alloparental. That means that both of us take care of the kids. And so it makes sense that men's brains would also do some changing, although not quite as many stretch marks or uh, you know, other issues. Um, but uh, what's interesting is there's nothing to suggest that it couldn't be anyone. Um, really, a grandmother or two dads or two moms, there's something in, there that, in our brain circuitry that makes us want to connect, and whoever is providing that, that solace, that comfort in early childhood um, is the one who's going to end up making that bond with the child. So um, in my case, luckily, it, it you know, it it was me, and I think that the mom is obviously the default because we give birth, but there's nothing to suggest that somebody else can't fill in that role if mom isn't up for it. Now, many therapists will tell you that sometimes marriages fall apart because of that adjustment to a baby. Sometimes babies who are not perfect cause that stress, and the term is we marry our children, and we mm -hmm. should remember that the couple is the primary focus. So how, based on your book, can I do that? I think by being aware of it. I think there's something in our biology that really fixates us on our children. And we spend so much time, you know, comforting them, taking care of them. And it's, it's important to sort of take a step back and realize that any relationship for it to survive is going to require attention and nurturing. 
and making sure that your partner is getting that as well. You kind of mentioned that in your book that you divorced. Yeah. After was, was this part of the reason? Um, I think it was. You know, it, it's hard to look back, and uh, you know, I think for many people, uh, there isn't some easy uh, explanation for why they divorced. You know, some people can say oh, it was this or it was that or what have you, but a lot of those us who fall into the irreconcilable differences, we don't know what went wrong exactly. Just when things would never be right again, and. Um, because of that, you know, you really want to look in and say, okay, um, I can't find any clear deviation from the past. Why has love changed? And I think in my case, my son coming into our lives did play a role in that. I was certainly very, very focused on him. Um, my ex-husband was very focused on him as well. And we probably could have done a lot by spending more time together and nurturing our own bond. I really applaud your honesty, and I asked the question since you wrote about it. Uh, I figured it would, otherwise I, I wouldn't have, you know, broached this topic with you. But I think it's uh, an important point we could make to help other relationships. So now, uh, embarking on a future relationship, what would you do differently based on your research and your own life experience? Well, uh, you know, I think that I, there, you know, there was this very interesting study done in cotton top tamarinds that were partners. And what they found that, of course, this, this level of affiliation, these partners that were lovey-dovey and very happy together, um, had corresponding high levels of oxytocin, which is called the cuddle chemical. Mm-hmm. And, but when the researchers looked at what was driving these levels of oxytocin, what they found, it was when the partners were giving each other what they needed. So females might be giving uh, the males sex more often than they'd want, and the males are giving the females more cuddling and grooming. And, you know, it's something we say a lot, that you need to, you know, make sure to help your partner and take care of your partner. But I, here you see, even in, in monkeys, they understand that they can have a better relationship by you know, concentrating on making your partner happy. And it goes both ways. This isn't, I think women so often uh, do everything to please the man and then they get nothing back and they get resentful. Mm-hmm. But if both partners are concentrated on making the other one happy, it's just good all around. I think that's really a great way to conclude. And uh, we can learn a lot from the animals <laughs> and take our cue. Thank you for being a wonderfully informative guest. And, oh, thank you. And I think this is a very helpful book. And okay, so I'll make a list. <laughs> Be well. Affirmation of the week. To win a great victory, remove your heavy armor and shed your emotional baggage. And now for the latest medical trends. For men diagnosed with low-risk localized prostate cancer, being treated with the drug Abidart delays disease progression and initiating active treatment as it reduces anxiety. The experience of the daily positive effect, a mild, happy feeling, and self-affirmation helps some patients with chronic diseases, and this includes coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, and asthma, make better decisions about their health, as cited in the Archives of Internal Medicine. For more than 40 years, scientists and physicians have thought that eating a high-fiber diet lowered a person's risk of diverticulosis, a disease of the large intestine in which pouches develop in the colon wall. A new study of more than 2,000 people reveals that the opposite might be true. Discuss this with your doctor. In a study from WashU, powerful people think they are taller than they really are. I found that amusing. Uh, family companions who routinely accompany older adults to physician office visits could be helpful to healthcare quality improvement efforts. And men may be at a higher risk of experiencing mild cognitive impairment or the stage of mild memory loss that occurs between normal aging and dementia than women, according to a new study in the issue of neurology. 
A researcher found that students threw out 15% less food when posters about wasting food were hung in dining halls. Eliminating dining tray also decreased waste, reduced cost, and improved student satisfaction. Despite receiving supplemental food benefits, some families can't afford infant formula and water down the formula to feed their babies. And we need to pay attention to that because that's so unhealthy. And don't wear your headphones, pedestrians, because you're going to get hurt, <laughs> according to new research. But we knew that, didn't we? Well, we come to the close of another show. I have an educational website on stress management totally free. Turn on your inner light.com. And all the radio shows with the guest experts are archived for your listening pleasure. Subscribe to my free newsletter at turn on your inner light.com and you will get the latest radio interview, a fresh new article on stress management, and the health tips fully delineated, emailed directly to you from turn on your inner Have a wonderful week and see you on the radio. Bye.